The differential rate law is one way to characterize the rate of an equation, but another way is to look at the time evolution of the reactants. And what we want to explore in this video is how the two uh, perspectives are related to one another. So our learning goals are to use the differential rate law to determine the time evolution of the reactants. So let's see how we might track reaction progress. Suppose you know your location and how fast you're moving and what direction you're headed. I'm sure that you would be able to predict where you'll be in the next few seconds. Now you may not be able to predict where you'll be in an hour, but you certainly know in the immediate future where you will be. So let's consider what that looks like for a reaction. So here's our again our favorite reaction, N2O4 going to two NO2s. And the rate law in this case we're going to suppose is a first order rate law. So the rate is equal to the constant K times the concentration of N2O4. So if we know what the concentration of N2O4 is at some time zero, and I'm going to use a subscript, subscript here to indicate the time, then we know that the rate at that time is just going to be K times that concentration. So in other words, this is something that I can actually calculate. And this thing K times the concentration tells me the slope of the change at that point. All right, so how can I use that? So in other words, what I know is I know where I am. I know the concentration at time zero and I know how fast I'm going somewhere else and what direction I'm headed. So the change in the concentration now, I could just take that uh, last equation, the minus delta N2O4 concentration over delta T equals K times the N2O4 concentration at time zero and rearrange it. And when I do that, you can see if I multiply both sides by negative delta T, I would get this equation. All right, so what is this telling me? This is telling me that the change in the concentration in that first interval delta t is changing by this amount, minus k times the concentration itself. But I want you to notice in particular that this is zero. This is by design because this is a reactant. It's disappearing. So this slope needs to be negative in order to reflect the fact that the reactants are going away. Now I may want to project out where I would be at some later time delta t and in that case, I would say that the, uh, the place where I'll be at some later time delta p is where I started, the initial point, n 240 plus the change between n 240 and the change at time delta t. Now, I have an expression for that already, because that's what's directly above, so I can just plug that in. And when I do, I get a very uh, simple equation that the concentration of N2O4 at some time delta t is just equal to the value of the, the initial concentration at time 0 times 1 minus k delta t. Now let's see what this looks like graphically. So here is a graph where I'm showing the concentration of N2O4 on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And I'm going to chart this out uh, for three times, t1, t2, and t3, that are after time 0. I've shown you where the initial point is going to start. Now, the whole point of this derivation is that we know at the initial time what that slope is, because it's directly proportional to the concentration of N2O4 at that time. So now if I just follow that slope, basically make a line, and see where it crosses time t1, that gives me an idea. So this is the slope. That gives me an idea of what the concentration will be at that time. Now here's where the tricky part comes in. Well, it's not that tricky. Um, what we're going to do is recalculate the slope. The concentration has changed. We know the slope is dependent upon the concentration. So now at this smaller concentration, the slope is not going to be quite as steep. So if I follow that slope, it's not quite as steep as it was the previous time. I'm again going to chart it out to a time t2, and that's going to record where I am at time t2. Now I'll do that again, and again, because the concentrations are getting smaller, the rate is getting smaller, which means it's getting more gentle. It's getting less steep. So the next one will be a little less steep yet. It tells me where I'm going to be at time t3. And of course, I can keep going in this uh, a couple more times. And eventually what I'm doing is I'm charting out a curve that tells me where the reaction was at different times. Now, in essence, what I have done is uh, mechanically created an integrated rate law. And this is basically a way of determining the time evolution of a reactant. And uh, we can do it for any reaction by just simply following these steps. We evaluate the slope and the concentration from the rate law. We extrapolate to a new concentration at another time, a later time, as we did in the graph on the previous slide, and just repeat. 
We keep doing that. And eventually what we'll get is the integrated rate law, which is a statement of how the concentrations change with time. So um, what we've done basically is done a very, uh, I'll say a poor man's version of a little bit of calculus. So I didn't want to scare you with calculus, but uh, really all we're doing is we are integrating the differential rate law. And that's what we've shown here. So what does this look like for the first order, uh, re, uh, first order rate process? So our differential rate law would look like this. So what we just showed. When we actually solve this mathematically, we get an integrated rate law that looks like this, where the uh, concentration of N204 at some time t, and you'll see that I've written that two different ways. One is a function of t, and one with the subscript t. I just want to indicate that these are trying to indicate the same quantity. Now, that concentration at time t is going to be equal to the initial concentration at time 0 times this strange thing, e to the minus kt. And e is this weird uh, transcendental function. Uh, actually, no, it's not a transcendental function. It's a weird constant that uh, uh, goes on, an irrational number that goes on forever. It's the natural base, and it's basically the basis for the natural logarithm, which I've drawn there. So a0 is the starting point for our calculation. k determines how fast the, kind of the function is going to disappear to 0. So if k is large, there's going to be a rapid decay to 0. And if k is small, we're going to have a slow decay to 0. Now I've drawn a picture of this function over on the uh, right-hand side. And you can see it's very similar to the picture that we derived in the previous uh, slide. We start at initial concentration a0. It slides down. It's like a, a nice water slide at a theme park. Um, and it will eventually approach zero at infinite time. So as time gets very large, that quantity e to the minus kt is going to get very, very small. Okay, but we now understand some of the elements that go into this and some of the elements that shape this integrated rate law for this particular equation.